Welcome back to The Boathouse, where this week Steve will take you through all that's left to complete before launch. Many in the comments seem concerned that Steve hasn't considered all there is to do before June 17th next year, which is our announced launch date. And that's definitely not the Steve I know. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll see that he's got full grasp on what happens over the next 10 months. And a quick reminder to check out the link below for our current Bonfire Campaign t-shirt, Celebrating Victoria. Decided to start up another life as a bookie, because it seems like there's a lot of people who don't believe we're going to be able to make the launch date, and we were a bit premature. So, taking bets, and uh, so far it's 10 to 1. They don't think we're going to finish in time. Which I'm putting money on that because uh, <laughs> I can't wait to cash out. So let's take a little gander at what we got left to do and why I'm so confident that we'll be able to launch on June 17th. And uh, maybe these odds will change a little bit in the books. We'll see. You might notice a bunch of bike boxes here and uh, I haven't started another job as a bike mechanic or gone on a cycle biking buying spree. Uh, but we're getting ready to lay the deck and these are to cover the deck once it's laid so that we can continue working and not damage the deck. So I have a friend who works in a bike shop and he's been collecting the boxes for me as they assemble them so that we have nice clean cardboard to cover that deck with. So looking here at the stem, we get asked all the time whether this is gonna stay square and what we're gonna do with the planks that are sticking out a little bit from the stem. And this is all eventually gonna get fared. And we haven't fared it, and you can see it's all beaten up. And that's from us clamping to it and bumping into it with things. I have this jack stand unpadded, very rudely shoved against it. Uh, and this was a conscious decision to leave this square so that we didn't need to worry about it. And we had a nice thing to attach to, and we can even put screws into the very corner if we want to, knowing that it's gonna get fared out. So when it comes time to fare the hull, this will all get cut back to be a nice cut water. It'll get a bronze stem piece put on it. These will get bunged where the bolts are. And down below, there's a big jagged part and a piece that seems to be missing. And that is where the worm shoe is gonna go. And we made the worm shoe many, many moons ago. Uh, and that is waiting for its day to get attached as well when we fare things out. So this is where the worm shoe goes. It butts up against the ballast keel down there and extends up into this notch. Obviously this corner here will get fared out uh, once we finish fairing in the hull. You can see that our garboard plank overhangs quite a bit here. And that's because it needed to be backed out very much at midship. So it went on very thick. So we already backed out. We took a lot out of the inside of the plank at midship so it could meet the curve, which means that we have extra meat right here and we have extra meat actually all through here on the stem where it hasn't got backed out. So when we fare, this will all get taken down until this is flush with the center with the stem here. And then this will all get shaped to be the cut water to meet in with the worm shoe and that'll all be nice and smooth. And when the boat runs aground, which it will someday, this is where you're most likely to bump and the worm shoe is a sacrificial piece that goes in here. We'll put any fouling paint and tar and roofing felt between the worm shoe and the stem. And it basically, if we ground out and we scrape all the paint and we damage that timber and shipworms, grivels get in there and start eating away, the paint and the tar and the felt will keep them from getting into the center line. And then that's an easy thing to replace. There's one at the stern of the boat as well. They're all made. Uh, we just didn't bother putting them in until we're getting ready to fare things out. They're sitting on a shelf. So we have to fare the, the stem here for the cut water. We need to fare all the planks to each other and to the stem. And we also need to do something with all of these gaps, some of which over the last two years have gotten somewhat large. Uh, and if you follow other builders, you'll see that folks have planked boats and then immediately gone to caulking. 
and we haven't on Arabella for a couple of reasons. One is we're really far inland, so the moisture, the humidity content here between summer and winter changes really dramatically. And when you're right next to the coast, that humidity is a lot more stable. We also planked in white oak, which is a timber that likes to move, so it swells and shrinks quite a bit with humidity changes and we planked with air dried timber, not kiln dried timber. So the planks that would went on the boat first down low had the least amount of time to air dry, which means they were wetter when they went on the boat and have had the longest amount of time to dry out, which means all of our biggest gaps are down low in the boat where the timber wasn't quite as dry and where the timber has had more time to dry out. As we go up the hull, generally speaking, they get tighter and tighter and tighter as those planks had more time to dry and had a lower moisture content before we put them on and haven't been on the boat as long. We've been slathering everything in linseed oil, which is why you see these little balls that are hanging off the planks in places and that's dried linseed oil. And that helps keep the moisture change from being quite so dramatic. So if we were to caulk the hull, the hull right now, what would happen is this summer, this winter, the humidity is gonna drop, the planks are gonna shrink, the gaps are gonna open, the caulking's gonna become loose. The summer's gonna come, the humidity is gonna rise, the planks are gonna squeeze, they're gonna squeeze against the cotton, they're gonna cram it tight. And it's just gonna make the cotton looser, it's gonna stress the planks out because they're trying to squish that cotton uh, and then they're relaxing from it. So what we elected to do is to just get the hull planked, finish building the boat, and this spring, before we go to launch, we'll tent the boat off, we'll caulk all the seams that are tight, and we'll add humidity with humidifiers and even just soaking the ground. And that'll bring the moisture content of the wood up just a little bit. As it comes up, it'll swell and our bigger gaps will close. And we'll ultimately end up caulking the boat over a couple months and doing all the tight seams letting it swell up a little bit, doing seams as they tighten up. Um, if we didn't do that, we would have to spline a lot of these lower seams because they're too open right now to caulk. And if we were to swell the entire hull in one shot, all of our tighter seams are gonna become too tight to caulk. So it's a little bit of a weird situation just because of the amount of time, because of the air dried timber. Um, and being so far inland. If we were right by the coast, this really wouldn't be much of a problem because the summer and winter humidity changes just aren't as dramatic as they are out here. Same thing if we planked with kiln dried stock or it's a wood that was much more stable like cedar or wana, um, but white oak, you know, it likes to move and, and that's part of the joys of it. So that's why we haven't gotten to caulking the hull and we will do that immediately before launch. At the stern of the boat here, uh, we have basically the same thing. I've got to cut the dead wood here back in line with the stern post. We left that long. Uh, this all needs to be shaped to fit the rudder hardware, uh, as well as just bring in a narrower cut water to the rudder. This is carved out here um, to fit the bronze piece that came from Victoria. But other than that, this still needs to be cut back and shaped for the propeller and for the cut water as well. Uh, and the rudder obviously needs to be built. There's a, there's a big old rudder that goes in here. Uh, we also need to put in the prop shaft and we need to mount the propeller uh, and do everything on the inside that attaches to the prop shaft so that we can make that spin and work. Uh, so there's, there's a good bit of work that needs to happen back here. Wait, what? There's decking on the boat? <laughs> when did that happen? We're not there yet. So one of the other things to remember with the videos is that we are generally two to three weeks ahead of wherever we are in the videos. And for us, that's just a necessity with the editing and the filming process. Uh, there's no way we could make Friday's video about what happened that week, because I don't really know when, when Ben would edit it. And if we shot, you know, this week and that was the video for next week, it means that Ben's working with the footage that was just shot days prior. And if there's any process that's slow, if somebody gets sick 
we end up with having to miss a video or have a really boring video. So what we try to do is stay two to three weeks ahead and that way if we're doing a lot of really interesting stuff we can spread it out a little bit and really show it well and if we're doing a lot of really boring things like milling lumber we can condense all of that and make it a lot more interesting. So when you're watching the videos and looking at the launch deadline and being like I don't think they're going to make it you have to remember that we're at least two weeks ahead of what you're seeing right now. And oftentimes we're three and very rarely, but sometimes almost four weeks ahead. And just depends on the ebb and the flow of the work and the videos. Uh, and if you follow other channels, you'll know that some of them are six months behind in video where they are in real time. And others are doing it immediately or presenting that they're doing it immediately. But for us, you know, we try to be honest that there's a little bit of a lag time. Um, so wherever we are in the video, you got to remember that we're a couple weeks ahead. So there's a few more weeks between what's in the video and when launch date is than, than what it really seems like, if that makes sense. And don't worry, we'll get to the decking very soon. There's just a lot of it. So we've been working really hard on getting some of that installed and not spending so much time filming it. And we're going to dive more into that in a little bit later when we have a little bit more of it on and show you guys the decking then so that it's not four weeks of decking. It's maybe a week and a half or two weeks of decking, which is going to be a lot nicer to watch. So between Victoria and all of the other boats that we've taken apart for parts and for lead for the keel, uh, we've managed to scavenge a ton of bronze hardware. And this is a tiny itty bitty microscopic fraction of it. But you can see we're starting to get things cleaned up as we're starting to work on the deck. So we have the Traveler here from Victoria, and we've got a piece of Victoria's rudder hardware um, and some fair leads and some chocks. We've got a cowl here. Uh, and these is, I mean, I can't explain how much time and energy and money is saved from getting them from the scavenged boats and from getting them from Victoria. Uh, if we hadn't taken Victoria apart, you know, and we hadn't scavenged those, we'd be looking at buying all of these, which you should go price them out. They're not cheap. And you can't get things like this bronze rudder hardware off the shelf. What we would have to do is we'd have to make a pattern and send it out to a foundry and get it cast and have it sent back and clean it up and go through that whole process, which is not only a lot of time, it's, it's not a cheap process. So Victoria was so similar in size and design to Arabella, I mean literally just a little bit smaller, that we can take her rudder hardware and just clean it up and put it right on Arabella, which is a huge amount of savings. And same thing with her traveler and same thing with cleats and leads, um, her windlass. So all of that is a huge time, energy, and money savings that all we have to do is, is clean it up and put it in. and. Thankfully, we have a whole bunch of very gracious volunteers who are willing to come and spend their time cleaning this stuff up so that KP and I can keep chugging away on the boat. These I am super excited about. So every once in a while, we get contacted by a company who is interested in hooking us up or working with us in some way, shape, or form. And not too long ago, Edson reached out, which they are based out of New Bedford, Mass, which is really not far from here. And they wanted to know what our status was for emergency pumps for Arabella. Uh, they were hanging out with some folks from Jamestown Distributors and they were telling them about our crazy project and where we were hoping to go and what we were hoping to do. And Edson seemed to think that a couple good emergency pumps would be a, a fine thing to have on board. So they reached out and wanted to know if we would have interest in them donating a couple for Arabella, which is amazing. There's no way on earth we would have been able to cough up the money to, to buy these pumps. So thank you so much for Edson for those. And what we have here are two different style pumps and we also have a rudder head. So Edson asked about the pumps and I went online and saw that they also made beautiful bronze tiller heads. Um, so that mounts on top of your rudder and your tiller handle goes in here. And I asked them if they would be willing to, to throw one of these in for us when they sent us the pumps. And they said it was a bit over their budget, but that they would do it. So thank you so much, Edson. Uh, and these pumps are obviously manual. They're huge diaphragm pumps. Uh, this one is fairly lightweight. It's made out of aluminum and it's mounted on this big piece of plywood. 
And this is designed to be stuffed inside a locker or a lazarette somewhere and come out when you need it. So you'd have your two hoses for your inlet and outlet. You'd shove one in the build, you'd shove one overboard and you just get to pumping. Uh, and this is supposed to do one gallon per stroke, which is, you know, as fast as you can stroke it. That's a, that's a lot of water. This one is essentially the same pump, except it's made out of bronze. So it's a bit heavier and obviously more corrosion resistant in the marine environment. And this one is made to get permanently mounted inside the boat against the cockpit. So the cockpit wall will go right here and this shaft here will protrude into the cockpit and there's a plate that goes over that and gets through bolted. So when you are in the cockpit, all you're gonna see is the plate and the little hole for the shaft. And if you need to pump out the bilge, if something happens, all you have to do is take out this lever insert it in, I think it, does it lock? Yeah, and then get to pumping. And this one will be permanently hooked up. So it'll be mounted, like I said, inside the cockpit um, with the removable handle, and it will be plumbed down to the bilge and it will be plumbed overboard. So if anything were to happen, You can be in the cockpit, steering the boat, and pumping like a madman. Uh, and with both of these pumps going, I mean, that's one gallon each for every stroke. So assuming you can do a couple strokes a second, that's, uh, or you know, even a stroke a second, that's 60 gallons a minute. That's, uh, that's a lot of water. So thank you, Edson. These are gonna be awesome. Uh, and once we get the cockpit done up, We'll get this one installed and we'll figure out where to put this one. Maybe I'll do a permanent install with this one somewhere as well. Maybe we'll leave it on the board. We will see. And then speaking of pumping things overboard, we have all of our fittings here for water coming in and out of the boat. Uh, so we have some seacocks and we have some strainers and we've got a bunch of through hulls because the engine needs two throw hulls. It needs one coming in with a sea strainer for the raw water intake. It needs one exiting for the exhaust. The water maker, which we plan to put in, needs one for the intake, one for the exhaust, the outlet. And then there's also just the salt water use on the boat for pumps, wash downs, that kind of thing. Um, so that's why we've got three of these filters. Uh, one will be dedicated for the engine one will be dedicated for salt water in the galley, as well as the washdown pumps. And the smallest one will be just for the water maker, so that the water maker is on its own system. So we're not gonna install any of this stuff until this winter, probably even next spring. Um, but with, you know, budgets and shortages and inflation and all of that jazz. Uh, we've learned the hard way more than once that if we can be three to six months ahead in purchases with this kind of stuff, if it's back ordered, if there's an issue, we've got the time. And if there isn't, and it comes here, it sits in the shop, it gets really dusty and uh, it waits for its day. But we know when we want to install through hulls, we want to start putting in sea strainers, we can just get right to it. We picked up our anchors uh, so we went to the Newport Boat Show and we were talking with the folks from Mantis and talking about our project and what we were doing and they were kind enough to give us a coupon for some money off and a discount code. So between the coupon and the discount code it let us buy these stainless steel anchors for the same price as if we had bought galvanized anchors. Uh, so we figured that Spring in the money for the stainless steel is worth it. They will never rust, they won't corrode, we don't have to get them regalvanized. Um, other than them being quite a bit more expensive, there isn't really a downside to going with stainless steel anchors. 
So we have a 45 pound here, which would be basically our day anchor. Uh, and then we have a 65 pound here, which would be considered for this size boat, uh, an overnight or a storm anchor. Uh, and Akin has specced a 45 pound day anchor and a 85 pound um, overnight anchor because the anchors that Akin was talking about are this older style fisherman. Uh, and you need a lot more pounds of fishermen to equate the same holding power that you have with these new Mantis anchors. Uh, the anchors that have come out, Mantis, Rachna, there's a whole bunch of different variations on the same theme. Uh, and from everything that I've read and heard and talking with cruisers, they sat and they hold better than just about any of the older anchors. Uh, and these are supposed to be really versatile, whether it be mud or rock or grass, they're supposed to set pretty well. So I'm looking forward to, to putting them through the paces. And one of the really nice things about these anchors, especially the M2, is that they don't have a roll bar or anything big up here. Uh, so we can mount these off of the bow sprit on the boat and they will be self-deploying off the bow roller. So when you haul it up, you know, this will go up onto the bow roller anchor will fall to its correct orientation and then you pull until the bow roller is nestled right in here and then when you want to release the anchor you just let the chain out and the anchor is weighted in such a way that it will naturally just fall right off the rollers so we can set these up where we don't have to go out there and manually send the anchor off or manually bring the anchor back on uh, we should be able to stay at the windlass and just have it roll right through um, so obviously we are not going to be installing or using the anchors for quite a while, but they're another thing. We, uh, we had the discount in the code and we struck while the iron was hot and now they can uh, sit around in the shop and look pretty and collect dust until it's time to put them in the water. So up here in the four peak, there's a decent amount that's only to be done. Um, the very forward section there needs to be outfitted for storage and the locker space underneath the bunks here needs to have ceiling put in, dividers, um, the doors from Victoria need to be refinished and installed. Uh, there's a storage space here that needs to be designed and built out. Obviously the bunk needs to go in. Uh, there's a locker at the foot of the bunk and the diesel tank for the diesel heater that need to get mounted and put in. And there's a hanging locker over here that Parts of it are built. Uh, we need to finish that out and put ceiling in. We also need to run the wires up here for navigation, bilge pumps, um, through hull transducer, and build the sole in here because obviously this is a pretty untenable living situation the way the, the lack of sole currently is in here. Uh, so there's a decent amount up in the four peak here to to get done and finished out and built out. We've got to run wires up here for lights, fans, charging ports, all of that kind of stuff. So we've got our electrical boxes here. We've got our main runs coming in. Uh, so they are all color coded. Orange is for pumps. Green is for lights. Blue is for charging ports and outlets. Uh, so once we figure out exactly where the lights and fans and pumps are going to go, all those wires get run in and tagged into these boxes and then these get covered up and these will be hidden inside the hanging locker here. So once the locker is built out, you won't see the boxes or the smurf tubing. The sole in this part of the saloon is obviously temporary, so we got to glue up the cherry and mahogany pinstripe sole and get that fit. We need some slats and some cushions on the bunk here. The diesel heater needs to be hooked up to electrical. It needs to be hooked up to the diesel tank, which needs to be installed on the bulkhead just forward of it. And its chimney needs to be put in. There's locker space back here to be built out. Storage space up here to be divided and built out. The doors from Victoria need to be cleaned up, refinished, and installed shelves in the bottoms of these to hide the smurf tubing and make it so it's not just a narrow point down there that needs to be made and installed 
the doors in the front here from Victoria need to be cleaned up and installed and that'll hide the water tanks. The water tanks all need to be connected and hooked up to the rest of the plumbing system. The water tanks are in, but the connections aren't made. Over at the workbench area, storage space underneath the benches needs to be built out. Uh, the water maker um, filters are going to get mounted behind the workbench, so those all need to be, be purchased and installed back there. Uh, so there's a little bit of work to do to wrap those up and have the water maker installed. The wood stove needs to be anchored down because currently it can go adrift uh, and its chimney needs to be installed. The galley stove is pretty much in. I need to seal around the drip tray in the bottom and it needs to be hooked up to the propane. We haven't run any of the propane lines over for that yet. So in terms of the, the, the galley here, um, unfortunately, I have to redo the counter. So we glued up these butcher block black locusts, which is beautiful, um, but like white oak, black locust moves a bit. And when Carolyn and I glued it, it was an incredibly hot day and we did not have much time. So we didn't wet things out and we didn't do really all of the proper prep that we should have. Um, we just kind of went for it and crossed our fingers. And through this past winter, when it got really dry, it's just all checked apart. Um, so I got to peel that out and redo it, which isn't a humongous deal. And we'll do it a little bit differently um, so that it doesn't fall apart. And I'm actually in some ways a little happy that it happened because now that the fridge is in here and the stove, the space is a little more defined. And I think I would like to bring the sink forward just ever so slightly bit. Um, and change how the sink interacts with the refrigerator ever so slightly. Um, so it'll actually be kind of nice to, to rework that a little bit. And then in the way aft part of the boat, we've got to get the diesel mounted onto its engine beds and we've got to get it hooked up to a through hole. We got to drill the holes for that. Uh, we got to clean out and install the diesel tanks. Thankfully, all the diesel tanks need is just to be cleaned and new fittings put on them, and those are ready to go. Get those mounted. Um, batteries, all of that stuff needs to be built in and put back here. We got to get the prop shaft in, coupled, cutlass bearing on it. Uh, we got to finish out the bunk. Obviously, there's a cockpit that comes through, so that needs to be built. And then the last kind of corners over here are the nav table, which doesn't have anything. We've got to get the navigation systems all built out. And the head is actually has the least of do to all. The water maker, pump, and filters are all going to go in there. So that's got to be purchased and installed back there. Uh, things need to be sealed up so that you can have a shower in here and not leak fresh water into the bilge and the head, the toilet, needs to be hooked up to its exhaust fan because this works as a desiccant head. So there's a constant pull of air in and out of, which helps remove the moisture from the fecal matter and helps it not to stink so much. Uh, so that's got to get plumbed in and hooked up, but that's not terribly difficult. So there is, there's quite a lot to do down below here in the boat. And then of course there's everything on deck. So hatches, cockpit, finishing the house sides, doing the house top, tow rails, mounting the windlass, um, putting in all of the cleats and the fair leads, uh, hoss pipes, um, deck irons for filling water, taking out waste, um, fuel, all of those need to be done and installed. We need to finish laying the deck. We need to cock the deck. We need to pitch the deck. So I ask you, how solid of an argument how have I now made that we are never going to make the June 17th date? Like, look at all this. Are we crazy? We must be crazy. Well, I am kind of crazy. Um, but now that we've talked about basically everything that we need to do besides the spars and the standing rigging and the running rigging, and sewing sails. Um, I'm sure there's a myriad of other things we'll come up with as we go through. 
But as you can see there, you know, there's, there's, there's still a lot to do, a lot of details. Um, but if we go and look at my super intricate master planning program, you'll see why I think I'm so confident. This is my master planning program that I developed at the very beginning of the pro project. And I actually, I have to say, this is one of the, in terms of organization, one of the best things that I ever did. So it's super simple. It's a big pane of glass that I had acquired somewhere at some time. And there's a piece of plywood behind it, a couple pieces of oak that hold it in place. And I painted the plywood behind it white. Or actually, I think I painted the back of the glass white and then mounted it on the plywood. So the nice thing is, it's essentially a giant dry erase board. So we can write with a dry erase marker and then just wipe it off. And I drew out this grid with permanent marker so that the grid doesn't wipe off. And I can set the calendar. It does about two and a half months. So as you can see, we've blown through. Robin and I are about to take off to Baxter for a few days. Uh, and when I get back, I'll reset the calendar. And on the side, we have a list of all the things that we're trying to do that, that day, that week. Um, and that's always evolving and flowing, depending on things go quicker or slower than we thought they would. And then here is the master plan to get to launch. Uh, so we're almost to September. And September, I want to get the deck laid. I want to get the cockpit made up. And I want to do the house sides and the house top which seems like a lot, but the house sides are already made. They just need to be fared and glassed. So that's not really a huge time thing. The top is strip built and glassed. And so that'll also go fairly quick is not terribly difficult. Uh, and the cockpit is also getting strip built and glassed. The cockpit, I expect to take the most time out of them all. Um, and the deck will be, you know, I don't know if we'll quite finish the deck in September, but that's kind of the goal. October, we are having a few people come in early October to start working on the standing rigging. I purchased the wire for the standing rigging and the standing rigging is the rigging that holds up the spars. So there are three either side for the main mast and two either side for the mizzen mast. So we'll get those made up in October and work on hatches and probably continue to work on deck because I don't think we'll get that done in September. November, before the weather gets too cold, I'd like to get the diesel tanks in, finish up the hatches, assuming we don't finish them in October, and work on installing the diesel. And Brooke from Yanny Diesel and one of their techs is going to come out and help us get the diesel all set up. We've already talked about what we need to do for that. And D'Angelo Marine is working on the exhaust system, and they're going to come help us with that as well. So the diesel, we've got a whole bunch of professional help coming in for that. And then in December, it's going to start to get cold, but not be too brutal. So I'd love to get the prop shaft and the prop installed and do the rudder and the tiller. And the paint and varnish room is big enough and the rudder small enough that we can do the rudder and the tiller in the paint and varnish room in the house if it's too cold to do that outside. And that's part of the big push of getting the hatches and the house sides and the deck and the cockpit all done September, October, so that we have warm enough weather where we can paint and glue and not get into trouble. So December should be prop shaft, prop, rudder, tiller. And then my plan for January is to just dive into the interior and February work on the interior and then start the rough fare and starting to break down the shop. And in past winters, it's been really hard because it's really cold. And this will be the first year that we'll be able to work in a warm environment because January and February are our two worst months here. Um, March, the saying here in New England is in like a lion and out like a lamb. So beginning of March can be tough, but by the end of March, we're, we're getting into some pretty nice days usually. And this year, the deck will be on, the hatches will be on, uh, and we will be able to fire up the diesel heater. We'll be able to hook up the galley stove to the propane tank, 
and we'll be able to go out in the morning, make a pot of coffee or tea on the galley stove, turn on the diesel heater, and be able to warm up the interior of the boat to a level where we can comfortably work in there. So between KP and I, in a warm environment, we should be able to get a lot of interior work done between January and into February. February, hopefully, we'll rough fare the hull and start to break down the shop. March will be a big push. Um, I'm going to try to get the bronze work done for the bowsprit, for the chain plates, for the stem pieces, for the mast bands. Uh, we already have most of the bronze for a lot of that. Uh, and in March, like I said, the end of March starts to warm up. So that's when we want to start swelling the hull. So we're going to start caulking and start swelling sometime in March, depending on when the weather starts to let us do that. And then April, we'll be starting to break down the shop. We'll be mounting deck hardware. Hopefully by the end of April, we'll be done with the caulking. When the caulking's done, we can fare the hull, paint the hull, fare the hull, paint the hull, fare the hull, <laughs> paint the hull, paint the hull. Um, and May should be basically painting the hull, uh, getting ready to move the boat take the boathouse down. We're hoping to move to Mystic sometime the end of May, beginning of June. And then at Mystic, we'll put the masts in, we'll mount the chain plates when we see exactly what angles they want to be in. Once the chain plates go in, we can put the rub rails on, but the chain plates will be made, the rigging will be made, the rub rails will be made. It's just going to be a matter of installing them. We'll put in the standing rigging, which will already be made and we'll do the running rigging. And the running rigging is what controls all the sails. So those are, uh, generally speaking, soft lines. Sometimes you use wire for certain things. And we will put the sails on. Now, if you paid attention to this whole list as I went through, you'll notice that there's a few real key pieces to having a finished sailboat that we are missing. Um, we don't have sails on here. We don't have spars on here. We don't have a tender. We don't have dead eyes. Um, and the reason we don't have any of those on the list is because we are not doing them. So in efforts of getting the boat into the water and getting out cruising and adventuring, which at this point is what I really want to do. Um, I had a dream of, of building a boat, going out in the woods and cutting down the trees and forming the planks and building a boat. And, you know, we're not there yet. We're not finished, but, but we're largely finished. I mean, I think if you took any human being on the face of the planet and dropped them into the boathouse and said, what do you have here? They would say a boat. They wouldn't say you have a part of a boat or you have most of a boat. They would say you have a boat. So for me, the, the building of the boat, I, I feel quite accomplished. I feel like, like that goal is, is not met, but it's, it's pretty much met. Um, so now for me, that really shifts to, I want to get out and go cruising and adventuring, which was the whole point of building the boat was to have an adventure and challenge building it, but also to be able to go voyage and adventure. Sail making is an art. It takes a long time. Spars are a little bit of an art, but mostly they just take a long time. Um, and the tender would be a fun thing. We've already covered the tender. Bob Emser from Art of a Boat Building is going to do that for us. He's going to do a brilliant job with the materials from Victoria. Um, so having that off the plate is really big. And then Doyle Sales has offered to make the sails for Arabella. Uh, so we landed on the cover of the Boston Globe a little while back. And Robbie Doyle, founder of Doyle Sales, saw that article and reached out and wanted to know who was doing our sails. Um, so we're going to meet up with Robbie Doyle very soon and we're going to go through the whole design process with them and they're going to sew the sails and Robbie wants to have everything done and finished by February when they start to get really busy for the spring season. So we can put in here, sales done, check, um, thanks to Doyle sales. So that is a huge one off our plate. Um, and spars is one that we also took off the plate. So we hired Keith from Shipwright Skills. So if you have an Instagram handle, go look up Shipwright Skills uh, and you'll find Keith's page. He's done all sorts of amazing work. He's done a bunch of spars. He did a really cool build the other winter of a ram's horn sled. 
Um, he also makes content. So kind of like Bob Emser, it's just a perfect fit. Um, we can help Keith show his work and grow his audience. Uh, we can get some really incredibly well-crafted spars and not spend a couple months doing them. Um, so by farming out the sails and farming out the spars, that takes almost a third of building the boat off our plate. So you'll hear people talk a lot about the hull is one third, the interior and the systems are another third, and like the rigs and the sails are another third. So by having volunteers come in and help us out with the standing rigging and doing sails through Doyle Sails and having Keith do the spars for us, that's a huge, huge load and many months work worth of work that, that are off our plate that we don't really have to think about too much. Uh, and speaking of systems, we have a whole bunch of stuff to show in that regard as well. So let's go check that out. So nav gear is something that I don't have much experience with. Most of my navigation in the backcountry and on the water has just been with a map and a compass. Um, I've done a little bit with GPS. I've got a Garmin uh, land-based GPS that I've used a bit, uh, but I've never done anything like really significant on the water. And talking with people, the answers are all over the place. I mean, Anne has cruised extensively and she's never had any of these fancy gadgets that are around. Um, and we've talked to other people who would not step onto a boat if it didn't have the latest and greatest of everything and everything in between. So I did a lot of hemming and hawing about how to set the boat up and, and you know, none of this is cheap and, and how's all, how are we gonna afford all that? And is it worth the money? And the tech is constantly changing. and one of the things that really tipped the scales is we got an email from a gentleman a while back who uh, has a company that distributes Blue Sea products and Garmin as well as a few others. And he reached out and said, you know, I love the project, been following for a long time. Um, one way that I would love to contribute is I would love to supply you with anything that I can at wholesale. So whatever I pay for it, whether you pay for it, I'm not gonna take any markup. Um, which was huge. So Blue Sea and Garmin were two of the companies that he worked with as well as Standard. So that changed the game dramatically. When I went to price all of this out, um, that cost difference made it possible where it was like, all right, well, you know, it's, uh, it's gonna be X amount wholesale, but, but you cut that down and, and it, it's a huge difference. And I also realized that it's gonna be easier to put all of this in the boat now and decide that I don't use something and take it out later than it's going to be to get on somebody else's boat with say radar and be like, oh man, I really wish I had radar and then have to chase those wires and figure out where you're gonna put it. Um, so between the discount and the thought of it's easier to remove it than it is to add it, we just kind of, <laughs> kind of went whole hog. Um, and I've been using the paint and varnish room here. We obviously don't need it right now for painting and varnishing, but it's been really handy to lay this stuff out and play with different iterations. So I think this is roughly how I want to lay out the nav table. Uh, and what we'll do is on the very on port side, um, we'll mount where the VHF radios go and those can go tight to the wall. We got this beautiful little cubby that needs a little love from Victoria. Uh, so that can go in for some storage. And then we got two, actually three blue sea panels. Uh, I know, which seems like a lot. But if you read through the books and everything, basically every pump in the boat should have its own line and its own breaker. So when you start to add that up, you're like, all right, well, we, you know, we have a wash down pump in the cockpit. We're gonna put a wash down pump up forward um, by the anchor so that we can rinse the anchor chain off. So there's there's two. And then we've got one for the water maker. We add in a couple bilge pumps. Um, you know, so now we're at four or five pumps and that's with a manual water system. So it starts to chew up panels really quick. Um, so our thought is that we can, we can have our main panel and we can have two sub panels. So we can do, you know, nav gear or lights or we can break it out. And I haven't quite decided on, on how that's gonna go. And with putting in the main wires with the bus bars, 
the way we did. Adding and subtracting down the road is going to be really easy to do. So I wanted to make sure that there was also extra breakers. So I would love to wire the boat up as we see it now and have, you know, these four or five empty and three or four down here empty and two or three over here empty so that, oh man, we really do need to add another whatever or something comes out that doesn't exist nowadays that we want to add. It would be really easy just to pop in another breaker and we're not trying to jump things on or figure out where to add another panel. I picked up two chart plotters. So we have a 12 inch here to go down at the nav table. And I also got a 10 inch that we'll put on deck. We'll look at that in a minute. And I got talked into a GMS 10 and a card reader, which in all honesty are, are not needed. Um, but I understand how they make the system work a little bit nicer. So when you get a new map area update, you need to access the back of the chart plotter. I think it's here where the cards go in. So obviously you need to have that be somewhat accessible. Um, so if you were to flush mount this and screw it in, you know, you need to get back there somehow. And when you run more than one chart plotter, they can have disagreements when they're trying to talk to, say, the radar. So if both chart plotters are trying to pull the information from the radar, to my understanding, things can sometimes get jumbled. Um, so what we have here is an SD reader. So we can just mount that off to the side, somewhere unobtrusive. And when you open that up, it's got the slots to put in the SD cards. And then we have the GMS-10. So what happens is the, the two chart plotters get plugged into the GMS-10, the radar, um, the wind data, that all gets plugged in. And then all of those different things talk to the GMS-10 and then the GMS-10 distributes it. So by hooking all of this up, we can open up our box, we can put in a new map card, and then that will update the chart plotter in the cockpit and it will update the chart plotter at the nav table at the same time. And we won't have to go put the card into one and offload it and go put the card in the other. Um, so I think that that'll be, that'll be really, really handy. And that's pretty much what you'll see at the nav table, as well as a few charging ports here. So we got a couple for um, cigarette plug styles uh, and some USBs for charging whatever you need to charge at the nav table. And then up forward in the boat, we got a Furuno transducer. So that will, it's a multi-sensor and that'll let us know what's going on down in the water. So that'll get mounted through a through hull. And then this is the instruments that we are gonna have on deck. Arabella is catch rigged, so she has a mizzen mast that's right aft of the house, which means you can't have a center companionway because there's you know, a stick in the way. So her companionway is set off to starboard, which means to port of center line, we have a nice big expansive open house top, which is gonna ultimately be underneath a bimini dodger type situation. And that's where we're gonna to wanna to mount the other nav gear. So we've got a 10 inch chart plotter to go there. And we have a GMI 20 and the GMI 20 will talk to the transducer and back here, it will talk to our wind setup. So it'll tell us our wind speed, our wind direction, um, our water depth, our water speed. That'll all get displayed on the GMI so that we don't have to have that on the chart plotter. We can have the chart plotter up showing us where we're going and we can look at the GMI for all of that other information and don't have to be switching back and forth between screens. It'll also let us turn the chart plotter off and just see the information on the GMI, which would be really nice and let us conserve batteries depending on where we are and what information we really need. The other thing that we picked up for the cockpit 
um, is a handheld that gets wired to the VHF radio, which is another thing for the nav table, um, but they are currently, it's back ordered, so we are waiting on that. Yet another reason for getting this stuff so far in advance. We've been, we ordered the VHF about three months ago uh, and we still don't have a date on it, which for us is no big deal. But if we waited until April to order it, <laughs> we'd be in trouble. So this hooks up to that VHF uh, and gets mounted by the cockpit. So instead of having a cord running from at the nav table up through the companionway and into the cockpit, we can wire this up um, somewhere by the bridge deck so that that's unobtrusive and you could have the companionway completely shut and still be able to be on the radio while you're in the cockpit uh, and have that be, it's wired into the main VHF that's down at the nav table. So it's not just a little handheld unit. And then this is just about the last of our goodies here. So we have a weather satellite receiver um, for sailing as well as for climbing and mountaineering and doing all the things that Robin and I love to do. Having weather and updated weather is super important and we plan on being in places where there's no cell service. So being able to have that satellite weather I think will be, be worth its weight in gold. And this receiver is very, very tiny. That's it. So that just needs to have a clear view of the sky and uh, we'll be able to get satellite weather updates, which I think will be worth its weight in gold. Um, this one I was unsure about. I'm still mildly unsure about, but we will see. This is a satellite compass. So this is a, a newer product and to my understanding, you can see it says front. This makes it so that in real time, it shows you exactly where your boat is pointing. So I don't know if any of you have had the experience where you've had a GPS and it's showing you what your track is, but it's not showing you the direction that you're facing. And to my understanding, this solves that. And this also means that because it's satellite and done through that, that you don't need to calibrate the um, chart plotter as much. That when this is all hooked up, this will make sure that the chart plotter is always calibrated no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing. It's not something you need to think about. And when you look at your chart plotter and it tells you you're facing this way, you are at that second facing that way. Um, which boats, especially sailboats, move really slow. And I understand how it's probably people like, you don't need to know what way your bow is facing at this particular moment. Um, but the idea with all of this is to really plan for the absolute worst case scenario. So if we are in some remote narrow channel and the fog comes in, uh, it will be really nice to, to throw on the radar, which is up there. I didn't pull it out, but we've got an 18 inch radar dome. So to be able to pull out the radar, so there's our, our radar dome. And then this is the AIS VHF antenna. Speaking of AIS, we got AIS that's also back ordered. So waiting on AIS as well. Um, so between all of this information, we'll be able to turn on AIS and see if there's any big commercial boats around us. They'll be able to see us. We'll be able to turn on radar and get a better idea of what's going around us. We'll be able to look at the chart plotter and know that whatever direction it says the bow of the boat is facing is the direction the bow of the boat is facing. And as a new sailor, someone who doesn't have a ton of experience in the water um, and planning on going to some pretty remote locations and having the offer to buy all of this at just about wholesale um, made it a pretty easy, easy decision to, to go whole hog and to put it in and set it up. And it doesn't mean I have to use it. I probably won't have all this stuff on most of the time. I, uh, old school kind of soul and I love map and compass and that's probably how I do most of the navigation. But when that's not really an option, when you're socked in in the fog, when there's a ton of traffic, when there's an area that you haven't been to, when there's small fishing boats that don't have AIS and are operating off the radar because they're not some, they're somewhere they're not supposed to be, you know, all of this will help us see that and be seen and be aware of that and, uh, you know, voyage as safely as we can. 
So, so far we've talked about everything that has to get done to basically have a functioning cruising sailboat. But in reality, we don't need to launch a functioning cruising sailboat. Uh, and if you follow other builds and things, you'll see there's a whole myriad of ways to do it. Um, so I don't know if anybody follows uh, Ruth and Garrett from Salt and Tar, but if you haven't, go check them out. And they built their boat, Rediva, and they launched her, and it was a significant amount of time before they had their rig up and they were sailing. And they launched a mostly finished hull with a somewhat finished interior. Um, then there's the multi-million dollar professional restorations, like the Western Flyer. The Western Flyer just launched and she got um, towed to another location for engines and systems and electrical. Uh, the folks at Port Townsend, they basically just did the hull and the deck and that kind of thing. Um, so she was launched very much unfinished. Then you have Samson Boat Company, who's restoring Tally Ho, and they say that they're two years away from launch, but they're farther ahead in the build than we are with a much bigger team. So I would have to assume that Tally Ho's going to wait until everything is done done, which makes a lot of sense because Leo's literally an award-winning sailor, so when Tally Ho launches, he's going to be able to ready go cruise. I need to learn how to sail. I need to learn, like what things I want next to my bunk. Um, so there's a huge kind of incentive to have a lot of stuff tech really unfinished. Um, so here in the Four Peak, you know, I want to get the, the bunk done so we have a place to sleep and store it underneath the bunk done. But I'm not going to do anything in the Four Peak. We're going to leave all of that as is until we decide exactly what is going to get stored up there. Um, there's storage space here that's right next to the bunk. This needs to get defined and built out, but I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to want next to the bunk and what we're going to want to put there. Uh, same thing with the locker that's going to go down at the foot of the bunk. Um, you know, it's going to hide the, the diesel tank, which will be back up in here somewhere. Um, but I got to see, you know, how deep that locker comes in, what we really want to store there. So for the time being, we can cut a mattress that goes back to the bulkhead there. We can put in the diesel tank so that we can run the diesel heater this winter and have comfortable working temperatures in here. And that first year or two in the water, we'll build out the four peak and build out storage here next to the bunk and, and build out the locker at the foot and do a bunch of those details. So you're saying there's the filters for the water maker. They're going to go back here. I don't even think we're going to buy the water maker until after launch. Uh, we'll get that installed later, so I'm not going to bother putting that in. And I don't think I'm going to finish building out the storage cubby spaces underneath the bench either. And we'll wait to move aboard and, and see what we really want to put there. And my willingness to launch the boat unfinished, uh, a big part of that is because of this workbench and this vise in here. So when it comes to building lockers in the four peak and finishing the cubby space under here. It would be pretty easy to store a small selection of lumber in the four peak or back in the engine compartment or underneath the bunk or, you know, a bunch of different places. And then that first year or two on the water when I'm learning to sail and shaking down the boat, uh, we can just slowly at the bench build those things uh, and pick away at those projects as we see how we actually want to live with it. Same thing with the storage space uh, behind the Dickinson heater. Uh, you know, we have we have a pretty big storage space back here. We'll we'll figure out what to do with that and how we want to set that up. Uh, the diesel stove, we'll get that all hooked up this winter so that we can be warm in here when we're working this winter. Um, but we can't light the wood stove in the boathouse. I feel very confident and safe about lighting the diesel here in this giant big boathouse, um, but I do not feel confident or comfortable lighting the wood stove. So we need to tie the wood stove down and make sure it's anchored before we truck the boat to the water and launch, um, but we don't need to put in the chimney and get all of that stuff done. I can do that, you know, next October. There's no rush on that. Even the first winter, we'd probably be fine with the diesel heater, or maybe we just go south the first winter and the wood stove doesn't even get hooked up for a while. Uh, we got a lot of options. 
there's a lot of stuff on deck um, that is also going to wait until after launch. Definitely want some sort of Bimini Dodger uh, over the companionway and ideally the bridge deck so that you have some shade in the cockpit and that you can open the companionway in the rain and not have the rain just come pouring through. But I am not confident at this point to say what style I want that or what would look good or how tall or how wide or how deep. Uh, same thing with mounting and hooking up solar panels. Not really sure where to put those, how to play with that. Um, Self-steering rig for doing things in the trades. We'll wait on that. Um, we'll wait on putting on uh, wind turbines. Basically, most of that regeneration we'll figure out shortly after we're on the water and see where things shake out. So between now and June 17th, uh, it's basically a triage list. So everything that needs to be done for the boat to go into the water will be done. And if we were to look at it that way, I mean, we could launch in like three months. Like we could launch before the snow flies. We got to finish up and seal the deck. We've got to put the diesel in. We got to put the rudder on. Uh, and we've got to fair and cock the hull. And that's about it. We don't need spars. We don't need a bowsprit. We don't need a rig. We don't need an electrical system. We don't need an interior. We don't need any of that to launch. Um, so we'll spend this summer, the rest of this summer and the fall, doing everything we can on the deck that needs to be fiberglass, that needs to be painted, that needs to be done while it's warm. Uh, and then this winter when it's brutally cold, we'll retreat to the interior and do what we can to make that functionable and livable, but it doesn't need to be finished. And then come March, it'll be the real big push to get the hull wrapped up so that we can go into the water. And we've already got some helping hands and volunteers lined up for that spring. Uh, and when we get to Mystic, we will have the help and resources of Mystic. So when it comes time to put the spars in and um, get the chain plates put on and install the rub rail and all that kind of thing right before launch, we'll have an incredibly experienced crew at Mystic to give us a hand doing that. So we'll be able to, to really blow through a lot of work pretty quickly. And same thing, people will ask about volunteer opportunities and you know, bunging the deck, bunging the hull, uh, sanding and fairing the hull. We're gonna do those as really big work parties. And when that time comes, we're gonna spread the word. And you know, it's probably a couple hundred hours to longboard and fair the hull. And I wanna do that in like two days. I will take the staging down, we'll clean everything up, we'll make a bunch of longboards, we'll throw a party, and uh, we'll do basically a mini open house and free food for two hours at the torture boards, and we can have 20 people at a time sanding on the boat. The hours will add up really quick. Same thing with fairing the deck. Uh, so when it comes time to those things, we're going to be able to throw a lot of bodies at it. And speaking of volunteer things, um, we've got dead eyes, we've got rigging, uh, we've got a few other things that we want to throw a bunch of bodies at. So we are going to put out a call pretty soon in more detail for the things that we're looking for for that. Um, and hopefully some folks can come and help us out with doing some wire splicing and doing some parceling and serving. And we'll get into exactly what all that is and why it's important and what it does. Um, but we're getting to the point in the build where we can have a bunch of people come in and we can get a bunch of big projects like that knocked out.